This video is for anyone who's ever lost a four-legged companion. In the past few weeks, there is a tragedy within the family. My mom was taking our dog for a walk. Um, I travel a lot with my work and spend time in different states and sometimes abroad. But I go back to northern Idaho at times, especially as she's getting older and has more needs that I need to attend to. But it was on a Sunday and my mom had taken her out. And one of the neighborhood dogs that was much bigger <laughs> attacked our dog. And she was seriously injured. And my mom rushed her to the uh, veterinary clinic uh, with the owner of the attacking dog and they stitched her up and I was in frequent contact with mom during the following days and I was very hopeful that she would recover but the infection began to spread through her body and they went back in to do surgery again and it was affecting her liver and other internal organs. And sadly, they had to put her down. And which I don't cry very often, but I sure did that week. <laughs> From the age of, I don't know, maybe five or I've had dogs in my life. And my first dog was a miniature collie named him Wolf, <laughs> but Wolf somehow got out and was picked out by the animal control. And mom didn't have the money to bail him out at the shelter, so I never saw him again. And then when my mom remarried and her husband at that time moved us to Southeast Texas and I didn't relate or resonate with that culture at all. There are a few individuals here and there, a few friends, but I spent a lot of time alone during those years. We had a, a Cocker Spaniel that was white with brown spots, and she was the only real loving connection I had during that time in my life. She helped me get through those very difficult years. And I took off on my own at the age of 17. I began to hear accounts of the, the traditional Native American doctors. I had this fascination with American Indians and their culture. And at 14, I decided, well, if ever given the opportunity, this is what I'm going to do with my life. So I took off and landed in a community of predominantly Kiowa Indians and southwestern Oklahoma, I went on to apprentice with one of the last surviving traditional doctors of the Kiowa tribe. But when I left our dog there, her name was Fancy, and she was heartbroken. At that time, I was, was still very dissociated. I was carrying a lot of the trauma from my childhood and adolescence, and so I lacked much of the empathy that I feel I have now. <laughs> I may have forgotten <laughs> my name, if I haven't already shared it, is Ben Ufana. But anyway, let's keep going. I've always had this affinity or affection for animals. Often people's dogs and cats are, are drawn to me. I think they sense something about me. And I would love to have a dog of my own that I could keep with me. But through all these years, I've traveled much of the time on, on the road. <laughs> and so that makes it impossible, basically. And in some ways, I've compensated by my bond with the dogs and cats, the people I work with. A woman some years ago, she had this cat named Tiger, and he would get so excited whenever I came over. And you could just see him light up, and he'd walk with this kind of stalking motion. And this woman would say, Tiger, your friend is here. 
And this other friend had this huge Malamute, it's Alaskan dog, and Caleb would start howling. <laughs> and he was like, she doesn't do this for anyone else. But naturally, there's this resonance. So my mom and her husband, who has since passed away, somehow this stray schnauzer showed up and they took him in and named him Prince. And Prince was an incredibly intelligent dog, just wonderful personality and mom adored him. And, but shortly after they moved to northern Idaho, he became seriously ill and died. Mom was absolutely devastated. Still grieving, they began to look in the local newspaper and saw an ad for silver schnauzer puppies and responded. And the dog they took home with them, Murphy, was not all that responsive at first. I think partly because some other people had taken him before and had abused him. And so he was still carrying the trauma. Aside from that, his and mom's personalities clashed at times. And although Murphy didn't bark incessantly, like some dogs, he would at times serenade the neighbors, which drove mom crazy. And so there were many occasions where she threatened to get rid of him. And I felt like I was caught in between the two of them. I was always trying to advocate for him and get him like, would you just, I'm trying to hold it together for you, Murphy. Would you just tone it down some? <clears throat> and I was hoping that I would partner up with somebody that I could share an apartment with and be able to provide a home for Murphy so I could take him on and I companion would be there when I was gone, but being in New York City much of the time and in Boston every other week working and commuting overseas, that reality never came to pass. It was so difficult for me to connect in New York City. I was traveling back and forth to Sri Lanka. I had was in two serious relationships over the years. I've been to Sri Lanka about 15 times. <laughs> I was commuting back and forth. But as the years are passing by and realizing that Murphy's time on Earth was limited, and there was this sadness. And on April 15th in 2019, mom had to put him down. And I grieved his loss for quite some time, it was, there was a closeness. In the time that we did spend together, there's this incredible bond between he and I. And in the years after, you know, during COVID lockdown, I felt this horrendous void. I ended up staying at mom's house for some months, uh, which was challenging, but I didn't want to be stuck in New York. In, in lockdown and at least in Idaho, I could go out and there's a mountain range in front of mom's house. It goes all the way into Montana. <laughs> I could walk for days <laughs> even. And so I would just go out and hike in the mountains. But there's this void because Murphy was gone and there his ashes sat in a box on the dresser. Two years later, mom decided to get another dog and responded to an ad that she saw and ended up driving somewhere west of Spokane and brought back this adorable puppy. She sent me the photos initially and she was so small that she fit in the palm of my mom's hand. And then a few months later when I was back, I got to meet her for the first time and uh, mom called her Molly. I refer to her as Mahi, which is a Tamil name because I spent 
lot of time in <laughs> Sri Lanka and connected with that culture. And even though I was still grieving the loss of Murphy, gradually Mahi and I started bonding and she was so adorable. She became attached to me very quickly and I became her favorite person in the world. <laughs> and she loved to play tug of war and she had this I'm not sure exactly what it was. It was like this really long squirrel-like toy or something that she'd rip the stuffing out of, but she would have one end and I'd be holding the other and she'd pull back and forth and it was just growl ferociously. <laughs> she did so. And she had all these other toys. It was so cute, so adorable. She had this stuffed pig and a stuffed dragon. And the dragon was about as big as she was. And she'd be dragging it around the house. And we played a lot. I mean, she would be running around and around in circles in my room, sometimes jumping up on the bed across to the other side, back on the floor, back around the room, back on the bed again. I have to say I was greatly relieved when she outgrew the chewing phase because I no longer had to worry about shoes and phone cords and whatever else she might chew up. She also loved to root into my pocket. I could be sitting in a chair working at my computer and she'd jump up and it'd be diving into my pocket and pull out a, a napkin or a Kleenex or something and run off and she'd shred it all over the floor. And she had her own unique version of playing Frisbee. So what would happen is I would throw a Frisbee and she'd run after it. But instead of bringing it back, I ended up chasing after her to, to get the Frisbee, chase her down and wrestle the frisbee out of her mouth and toss it again and she'd run after it and i'd be chasing her just repeating that same cycle again Emahi was the most affectionate dog i've ever had she would be laying at my feet when i'd be riding sometimes using my foot as a pillow <laughs> or when i'd be sitting and doing meditation practice she would be laying across my lap, sometimes for hours at a time. And at night, she'd sleep in the bed next to me and while I was visiting mom. And then even as I would take breaks to lay down and take a nap after working for some time, the moment I'd lay down, she'd be jumping up in the bed and laying down next to me. Mahi absolutely loved life and other animals, incredibly curious. And one time we were walking and someone had a few llamas and, and she was fascinated, and especially whenever she'd see deer, she'd get so excited. And of course she'd want to chase them though. And she also loved people and the neighbors loved her as well. Mom would let go of the leash and she'd go running up to them and and just absorbing the, all their attention and affection. And, and so when Ma, Mahi got attacked, people throughout the neighborhood knew her and they adored her and were very upset and even more so when mom had to put her down. The neighbors sent I think maybe five or six bouquets of flowers to mom, you know, after her loss. For me, in many ways, it, it feels like losing a child. I have so many fond memories of her. And uh, though I'm sure I'm going to bond with other dogs over time, whether it's a person or a four-legged friend her companion, each individual who comes into her life is special and there's no way to replace them. I'd say the most unfortunate thing about forming attachment to a dog is the fact that often their lives are so short. And if you're fortunate, maybe you get to have your dog for 12 or 14 or more years. Sadly, some check out, leave us, far too soon as Molly was only 
three years old. Dogs, in many ways, make our lives much better. In our younger years, so many of us, we have these large circle of friends and acquaintances, and our days and nights are packed with concerts, parties, sporting events, and all kinds of other activities. But as time goes on, life changes dramatically. People become more involved in their families and possibly working and commuting long hours, dealing with other commitments. And so and because of that, other people are less available and we end up spending more and more time alone. And for many of us, dogs can make the best companions. When we have a dog, it's like we have someone that truly cares about us, someone who's overjoyed to see us and genuinely wants to spend time with us. And I am referring to my notes a bit here at this point. For many of us, a dog could be the most loving and consistent companion. And it's especially true for seniors. And those who have dogs tend to live longer. Much of that has to do with the love and companionship that a dog shares with us. And in a world where physical affection is often scarce, and many of us are touch starved, dogs offer a much needed source of comfort and affection. The fact that they're so affectionate, they help to compensate for the lack of physical contact that many of us experience with other human beings. Many of us lacking meaningful emotional bonds Dogs have this incredible ability to form these profoundly deep connections, especially when we care for them in return. And for all the love and companionship they offer us, they require relatively little effort compared to raising a human. We don't have to buy all this clothing or save up for years and years to send them off to college. Dogs also help us to break free of the sedentary patterns of being a couch potato or spending all this time binge watching uh, teledramas and rom-coms and Netflix or scrolling on social media or being caught up in the 24-7 news cycle because dogs motivate us to go out for walks. And when we're out moving around, it gives us the opportunity to meet other dog owners. A lot of times we end up talking to people. Maybe they think we have a cute dog or something. So make a new friend, find a date, maybe even form a more significant connection. There are so many ways in which dogs are vastly un underappreciated. And for many of us, they are the closest thing that we will ever experience to unconditional love. As I said before, they're thrilled to see us, they want to be held, and they're an extraordinary source of comfort. And many of us here in the United States are living alone lacking meaningful connections. And yet often we have so much space in our homes, even fenced in backyards. So if that sounds like you, please, if you haven't already, consider or not just think about it, act on it, take a dog in. Giving a dog a home, you could be transforming that dog's life and your own. You may be saving that dog's life. What's enormously tragic is the fact that they are around 3 million dogs in shelters across the United States alone at any given time. And something like about 360,000 dogs were euthanized that same year. And much of this is because people continue to buy dogs and breeders and pet stores, many of which are sourced through puppy mills. We're feeding the problem because by going to breeders and pet stores, dogs are bred, 
more litters are produced. And because of this vast overpopulation of dogs, more and more end up in shelters. And before anyone calls me hypocritical, I did mention to mom when Mahi passed that we really should look, go to the shelter to see if there's a dog that we resonate with that's a suitable match. And I encourage you to do so because so many of these dogs, and they end up in shelters for all kinds of reasons. Dogs produced by puppy mills are sometimes dumped in animal shelters at times when someone becomes physically ill or maybe the dog's owner dies and no one else is willing to take in the dog or cat. People, especially in a place like New York City, Sometimes you're forced to move and you move into a new building. It doesn't allow pets. And what happens? The dog goes to the shelter. A lot of these dogs end up getting euthanized. And it's, it's tragic. It's heartbreaking. The dog is absolutely devastated. All of a sudden, they're dumped in a shelter and they don't know why. And, and then, again, it, often they're euthanized. And sometimes a couple has a new baby and it's like, oh, we can't have a dog now. Or someone gets into a new relationship. Maybe it's a guy, finds a girlfriend and she doesn't like dogs and dog ends up in a shelter. Mass amounts of dogs and cats end up in shelters across the nation. And in places like Sri Lanka, dogs are running wild, packs of dogs. But even there, I would be out, especially after Murphy, uh, passing. And I would see these stray dogs. And if I had any food on me, or maybe if I was staying with a friend, I'd run in the house and grab food. But whatever food I had, I would just give to the stray dogs. And I would just, the best I could, I would be present with them. Because a lot of these dogs are fearful, and they're lonely, and they too need love. And so even though I couldn't take them in and give them a home myself, it'd be making eye contact and just being really present with them. Say, hey, I care about you. You do matter. I was talking about dogs being euthanized and it's really bad for pit bulls. Sadly, it is true the fact that some people raise pit bulls, abuse the hell out of them, teach them to fight. And for that reason, there are occasions where someone was attacked or mauled by a pit bull. And our, if it bleeds, it leads media. Our media that sensationalizes gore or violence will run these stories to get clicks or to retain viewers. And it's tragic because the extraordinarily high percentage of pit bulls that end up in shelters end up being put down. By nature, as long as pit bulls are cared for, if they're treated well, if they're loved, they're actually incredibly loving and affectionate dogs. I've had the opportunity to spend time and connect with many pit bulls, and I find them to be absolutely adorable. They're one of my favorite breeds, in addition to schnauzers. As I said, I was so hopeful that Mahi would pull through and that she would recover from her wounds. But sadly, that infection, which bacterial infections can be insidious, they just take over. and. Organs started shutting down and Mahi was still experiencing a great deal of pain and, and mom went ahead to put her down. It's, maybe it's my intuition or something, but I called. And in her final moments, I spoke with her. I just let her know. I said to her that I love you and I hope you'll be there for me when I cross over to the other side. I hope you'll be there to meet me. It saddens me to know that when I go back to visit mom over the holidays, that Mahi will no longer be there. I'm going to miss her laying across my lap during those long meditation sessions. 
laying next to me at night while I sleep or jumping up on the bed to lay next to me when I take a nap in the middle of the day. <laughs> and miss that excitement when she would see a deer and and playing with her all the fun that we had. I have so many fond memories of her. I'm thankful that with my smartphone, I did take pictures and has some really nice video clips. I just wish I'd taken a whole lot more. I never imagined this would happen. I just assumed that she would be with us at least till the normal dog's lifespan of 12, 13, 14, something like that. But, but she's gone and it is hard to get through this part. But since Mahi's passing, I've been bringing her into my awareness and sometimes imagining holding her close. And at times I, I'm feeling this profound sadness and this ache throughout my chest. And as that happens, I center my awareness and the depth of those feelings and sensations and breathe softly and deeply. And that's important. Whatever loss that you experience, which we all do in our lives, whether it's a breakup or divorce or a death of a loved one or friend or, or, or losing your dog or cat, it's, we need to be able to process or digest our losses and all of our lived experiences for that matter. And so when you send your awareness in the depth of you know, the sadness, the grief, and the loss, it, it helps you to digest your lived experiences, in this case, the loss and, and all the emotions. A lot of people numb out, they distract themselves. If they go through a breakup, some people just run out and start seeing somebody else or, or even if you lose your dog, some people will go out and immediately get another dog. And yes, it's great if you can take a dog from the shelter and you're saving that dog's life, very likely, or saving them from the suffering of being in doggy jail. <laughs> um, it's That part's good, but at the same time, you need to do the deep level processing. You need to grieve the loss, the sadness, the hurt. And sometimes when I'm doing this practice, there are these emotions that don't feel so wonderful immediately, but it does increase your capacity to love and to experience compassion for others. Maybe that's why when Murphy passed in 2019 and I was in Sri Lanka shortly afterwards and, and I would see these street dogs and and whatever I could do to show kindness to them, I would let them know somebody cared about them. One of the street dogs, Chuti, is what my girlfriend named her. <laughs> she was covered with all kinds of dirt, and I guess she liked to roll in the dirt. But I took her one day, and I just gave her a really good bath. <laughs> in addition to feeding her and holding her and given her lots of attention. I forgot to mention too that as I do this practice, as I hold Mahi in my awareness and breathe into the feelings, physical sensations, it also brings back a lot of the memories, the times that playing together and you know, one of the challenges that we had with Mahi initially was that she was so wild and somewhat untamable in the beginning. And it was especially challenging house training her. She continued to pee and poop on the carpet for over a year. So when I would be back to visit mom, I would take her outside at regular intervals. And whenever she did relieve herself, I would give her treats and give her that encouragement. And she wanted to please me. So 
that gave her more incentive to do her her bathroom business outside and eventually she started using the doggy door on her own i don't think i ever had a dog that was that attached or devoted to me i would be upstairs and visiting mom and i'd walk across the house if i needed to go to the bathroom or take a shower and she'd follow me and even taking a shower she'd be waiting there outside the bathroom door the whole time just waiting for me to emerge. She didn't want to go outside at times unless I was escorting her. Sometimes she didn't even want to let me out of her sight because she knew I left at times to travel and work in other cities. And so she always wanted to keep me within her sight. When you form a attachment, you connect with the dog. They're just always wonderful ways in which it's just a, a very amazing connection you know a bond that you experience with them and oh i also remember like late at night before going to sleep i'd roll her over and then i'd pick her up and i would hold her to my chest and her head would be resting on my shoulder and i'd walk outside and set her down and wait for her to relieve herself and take her in and then we'd go night night and so I, I miss all that so much. So again, uh, a lot of dogs out there need a loving home parent. And so especially if you have the space in your life and if there's a void in your life, if, there's, if you're feeling lonely, if you need a connection, please not just consider, but please even act on, you know, go check out your local shelter see which dogs you might bond or resonate with. Again, as I said, for many of us, having a dog is the closest thing we will ever know to unconditional love. So, and, and again, you may be saving that dog's life. So I think said a lot here. So I'll leave you with this for now.